Welcome to the Camona VPM online training. Today we want to um, tackle a very important basic topic about threading and transactions so you get an idea how that works um, within our engine because that's really important to get the idea. So if we look at the, um, the theory, it's maybe different to, um, if you know other BPM suites, they pretty often work differently so it's really important to, to get that correctly. So let's assume we start a new process instance. I call um, from a client, I call the start process instance by key method, um, by our uh, servlet, by our EJB, by a REST, so it's basically a servlet again, by a known thread, whatever. So it's basically you spending the thread, calling the method, and then internally we start a new process instance. And then we calculate our way through that whole process model. So for example, we start from there start event going to the service task calling the code attached to the service task that's important and moving on so this is everything done within the thread we are blocking the thread for the time and it's done within one transaction and that's important as well and we move on in the process until we reach a transaction boundary or a wait state i come to back to that on the next slide what are our wait states so this is done in one go. Then we have created the user task. So we give back the, uh, the client, the thread, and then um, basically the user task is existing on the task list. This is done in one transaction. Really important. Okay. Then on the task list, we see the task. We um, um, do something in the form. We call complete task. This is again a thread and it might be a servlet. And this picks up the process instance here. And moving on, in this case, calling the service task, calling the send task, and moving on to the receive task, which is the next wait state in our process. So again, from here till here, we do it on one transaction, in one go. And then the receive task means we are waiting for an external message. So somehow we get asynchronously um, an answer message um, delivered. We are calling the correlate message method on the runtime service and moving on. Maybe that looks pretty simple. It's different to other engines than in, in, in a sense that a lot of engines doing every activity, every task here asynchronously, which is pretty different. We will see that in a minute. I want to make that actually more concrete by looking at our example. You remember the Twitter process. I deployed the Twitter process in the background on my engine. So what I can do here, I can start a new Twitter demo process. So it's for me, um, the world. It actually doesn't matter what I enter here because what I did in the background, I switched off my internet connection. So the service task will not be able to access Twitter, okay? Because the internet is not available. It's actually a pretty good example of a system not being available due to network problems or whatever. What do you think happens here? That's a pretty interesting question, actually. So I go on the form, I approve it, and I click on submit. What happens? What do you think? I give you 10 seconds to think. Actually, I don't wait 10 seconds. You can you know, use the pause button if you want to think longer. The important thing here is um, because we're going into the client, uh, we, we're using the thread, we're continuing in the process, we're calling a service task, the service task throws an exception. Basically what we do, we throw the exception up the hierarchy, it's typical Java behavior. So we throw the exception out of the task service complete method and we roll back the transaction. So that means if I click on the submit button, I basically get an, uh, my, the stack trace. Okay, I couldn't execute that service task. Why? I always have to look at the root cause. Um, yeah, somehow it's some HTTP um, exception here. It's not really good readable from Twitter. Um, yeah, this one is good. Unknown host exception, API Twitter.com. That makes sense, right? And you see it's issued in the tweet content delegate from earlier. Then I call Twitter for J, then I'm in the engine. And somewhere there, I'm in the rest uh, here. I'm in the JSF form, sorry, I'm use JSF, the complete task. There's no process complete task, so I'm in the API. Okay, 
if I go back to my task list, I oh, sorry, I want to go one more back. I refresh it. I still have the review tweet here. Okay, so it has moved. The transaction is pretty much rolled back. It's really important to get that default behavior. It's how the engine ticks. So it doesn't matter how many service tasks you have in a row, they are executed in one transaction, in one go with the thread we get. So if we look at a maybe more complete or, or more complex example, it could be like we review the tweet. If it's approved, we publish it on Twitter. We store it maybe in some internal database and then we wait for five days before we process some statistics or whatever. In this case, both of the service tasks are done in one go. Okay, really important. Transaction boundaries, when do we end our normally wait states like the timer or like the receive task? We had earlier a user task because we wait for a human. We might wait for a message or a BPMN signal. Okay, that's pretty obvious. We will tackle the different BPMN um, elements in the BPMN modules. And we can have asynchronous service task. We will look at that in, in five minutes later in the module. So keep waiting for that. But it's important to, to, to get how that works. Now, the interesting question, is that a good idea in this case? Is it, is it a good process design? Because the the guy reviewing the tweet might be some manager. I mean, he cannot fix Twitter. If Twitter is, is broken, if the network is down, basically this guy cannot do anything about it. So it might not be a good idea to basically throw the exception back to him. So what we can do, um, we can change that behavior. And this is something we call asynchronous continuation. So if we configure the service task, we can click that asynchronous flag here. It's a pretty small flag actually, but it's really important to, to know that. I store the process model. I redeploy it. Mm -hmm. So I have my JBoss running. I saw the old exception. Okay, that's done. I maybe um, check my JBoss uh, in the background. It's uh, maybe interesting. So we start again, we start a new Twitter demo process. It's a new version basically because we changed something in the BPMN XML. Hello world, you will not see that anyway. Um, okay. So I'm here. I do the same stuff, I approve it. I don't get any exception here, that's important. The task has vanished. Okay, it's 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 gone. I still see the exception on, on my JBoss console. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Um, Twitter is not, not back yet. So it cannot call Twitter. So what happened here? And we can see that if we look in the, uh, in the cockpit, in the monitoring. So if I look at the Twitter demo process, we see there's one running instance in the publish on Twitter service task. So this time the behavior changed. We, we, we are not rolling back the whole transaction to the user task, but we're moving on and we're moving on till the service task. And there, because it's asynchronous, it's now a transaction only, it's a wait state. So we, uh, here we commit the transaction, we give back the thread, so everything is fine for the user task. And then in an own thread from the engine, we will see that in a minute, it's called the job executor, we do the service task. Okay, and if this fails, we now, we still roll back the exception, but we're starting from here. So we are um, basically still standing in the service task. Okay. If that cannot be executed, um, somebody has to care about it. We cannot throw the exception to the client. So it's no user which who cares about it. So we have to care about that, um, uh, what we call an incident here. So we show it in cockpit. The, the small exclamation mark here shows there is some error. Um, I can click into the process. Instance, I see the error. If I look at the incidents tab, I will see um, basically all the information I need. So um, uh, when did the error occur? What was it? It was a failed job. I come back to that in a minute. And I even see the stack trace. So that's from um, basically written in the engine database. So it's available um, on the process model. 
uh, so you don't have to grab any logs or whatever. So you, you just see it see it. Okay, that's the first important thing here to recognize. This is the ASUN grass flag. That's as I said, pretty small. Oh, sorry, pretty small, but very very important. Okay, what happened here? In the background, it's basically um, because we made it asynchronous here. That's that small flag, async equals true. We give back the, th uh, the, the thread completing the user task. And what we do is we write a so called job in our database. A job means that the process engine should do anything um, yeah, automatically. That job is picked up by, by what we call the job executor. You see that on the next slide. And then this own thread moves on in the process. If this fails, we get that incident and we have to monitor that somehow. Okay. Basically, the jobs are used for these asynchronous and for timers. Timers are also jobs because timers um, basically have to be activated by the engine itself automatically. Good. So what is the, the job executor? The job executor is basically a thread pool. Okay, so when we, you start the engine, you start um, the job executor as well. You can configure it to not be started. That might be interesting in some cases, but normally it's started. If you start it in a normal Java environment or Tomcat or these kind of things, we just use a Java util thread pool. If you start it on JBoss or WebC or WebLogic, you basically use a thread pool from the container. So it's really managed in a Java E environment. And we have one job acquisition thread. So basically what the job acquisition thread is doing, it's continuously polling the database for jobs. If it finds any job, it writes a lock to one column. So we can have multiple job executors running on different nodes. Uh, if we cluster, that works pretty well. If he gets the log, he basically executes the jobs um, with one of the uh, threads from the pool. So we only have one acquisition thread, and we have a um, configurable number of execution threads. So this scales actually pretty well. It's an advanced topic of uh, maybe optimizing that. For the moment, it's, it's sufficient if you understand what the job executor does. If you look at the um, current situation, if I have a look at the database, um, I can even see that job. So if you look in the job table, you see, okay, there's a job of type message. Um, I see the process instance stuff and it's a Twitter demo process. You see the exception stack trace, the exception message. Okay, so everything is in there. That's a job and the job executor. So far, so good. Um, this infrastructure is actually even more powerful. So if I want to, or if Twitter came back to life, you can even um, retry that job. So I can just say, okay, please retry it again. Okay. It will not help in my case, actually, because I haven't switched on my internet back. So it will still fail. So I get a new incident here. Okay, a fresh one. But it's important that you know that you can retry it. You can even configure automatic retries. So you could say something like, we try it for, um, I don't know, three times, period time, uh, 10 seconds. Okay, so it will do that. And deploy it to my JMOS. And what happens now if I switch back to the task list? I start a new version. It doesn't matter. Okay, so I review it. I approve it. Works. We get the first one. Um, be a bit quick now to the more process. Okay, you see it's currently in the published Twitter one. That was the second one. You see, I don't don't have any um, any incidents, so it's still a green a green light here. Now was the third time, and now it switched its state to um, uh, to fail. Okay, now I have the incident because it doesn't. Uh, yeah, reactivate itself. Now our operator has to have a look at that. You can query the incident by a REST API or a Java API. You can, um, uh, yeah, 
address that from your um, uh, monitoring or alerting infrastructure like Nagios or Nimbus or whatever you have. Okay, this is this. Uh, maybe to prove that uh, the retry is really working, I switch on my internet again. So that should work. Now I have internet again. Let's quickly verify that. Yeah, Twitter works. So what I can do is I can retry that one. Retry it. Let's switch to the history so I see a bit more here. So this one has finished and I see my tweet. Perfect. This worked. So this is a very, again, very important concept, asynchronous. Um, we have the transaction boundaries. So this is why we have the async here as a possible transaction boundary. You have the threading. You have the job executor. Okay. You have the retry strategy. And you have these so-called incidents um, you see in cockpit. That's actually a pretty powerful combination, what you can do with that. Okay, that was it for that small module. It's not a long module, but it's a very important module. Um, interesting for you would be to play around with that infrastructure a bit. So do uh, or change your um, Twitter process, make it asynchronously, um, add some exceptions or, or add some uh, network outage or whatever and play around with that and, and retry this stuff. That would make sense to do. Okay, thank you. See you next time.